The peace of Christ be with you. And now let us share that peace of Christ with each other as we greet each other on this Palm Sunday morning. Thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give, you, I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. We have there a psalm of praise, and this text today is one of the three uh, Palm, story, Palm Sunday stories where Jesus enters into Jerusalem. The stories are all told a little bit uh, differently, but this is the version as according to Mark. So please listen now for the word of God and the spirit of God. <clears throat> when they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who were following were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessing is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest! Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. May God bless the reading of the word. The next section in our bulletin says, Smart Phones and Wise Words. This is a little section when we are sending out the questions to help reflect on the sermon for the youth, both youth who are here as well as the youth who are not. So these are the questions that the youth will be getting today for Palm Sunday. What fears and hopes do you have for your future and your life? 
And what would Jesus see if he looked straight into your heart and your soul? Good stuff for all of us to think about. And it's off. This new technology is amazing. <clears throat> you know, it wasn't too many months ago that we all walked through and waded through, cheered, and maybe even cursed our way through one of the most contentious presidential elections in modern history. You see, presidential elections are about hope. They are about the future. They say a lot about who we are as a people and the values that we reflect, the dreams that we have as well as our disappointments. Now, of course, I have been at this long enough to know not to make any sort of political statements from the pulpit. I'll reserve my personal Facebook page for that. But I stage this sermon this way because Palm Sunday has many of the same elements that we see in a run-up to a presidential election. In campaigns, men and women, villagers as well as urbanites all begin to put their hopes in one particular person. A person that they believe will fulfill their physical, their economic, and their political hopes. And as the months roll on, more and more people begin to show up at small town rallies, lining the streets as their candidate makes his or her way through America. There are signs that are waved back and forth supporting their particular candidate, signs that are thrust up into the air and waved all around. There are buttons and ribbons that adorn hats and coats and sleeves. It seems that presidential elections can be like an overhyped circus full of both hope and future promise. And the months prior to a presidential election really are not that dissimilar to this particular day, Palm Sunday. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, which is the Washington, D.C. of Israel. To the cultural and religious center of Judaism, Jerusalem, Jesus is making his way there on a dusty little road. And with him are hundreds of people that he has touched throughout his ministry during his time of teaching and preaching and healing and offering his welcoming and compassionate presence. What I want you to do today is pretend. I want you to pretend that you don't actually know that this is Palm Sunday. There is no way that you could know what is coming ahead of us. And I want you to put yourself into the shoes of the people who might have known Jesus 2,000 years ago. You see, at this point, there's no way to know that in four days, he's actually going to share his last supper with his disciples. There's no way at this point that you could know that he even is going to be crucified. You have no idea what events are going to transpire about a week from now as Jesus, as Mary looks for Jesus and instead finds an empty tomb. I want you to imagine that you are standing along a dusty road somewhere just outside of Jerusalem, and your mind is only on what is facing you on this particular day. You've been walking far, the sun is hot, and you've taken just a few minutes to rest under a shade tree. It's a day when you do expect a somewhat heavier flow of pedestrian traffic on this road to Jerusalem, for you know that Passover is nearing and Jews will be making their way to Jerusalem to celebrate their religious festival. And so you are expecting a few more travelers on this day. However, what you actually see takes you by surprise. 
For far down the dusty road, just within eyesight, is a dark mass of something blocking the road. At first, you're tempted to think that they are just small bushes or trees, but their slow progress tells you that your eyes just haven't focused in yet. And as their form begins to take shape, you realize that this dark mass is actually a whole entourage of people. From where you stand, you estimate that there must be about 300, maybe even 400 of them, slowly approaching you on this lone road to Jerusalem. But what really puzzles you, as you watch this mass approach, all across the countryside, there are small specks of people who are joining, converging from paths and roads, from farms and houses. And as the entourage approaches you, you are surprised by the diversity of all of those who are coming toward you. You see whole families. You see smaller groups of men as well as mothers and children. There are merchants and fishermen. There are farmers and craftsmen. And as the mass approaches you, you realize that the group has now doubled in size in just a very short time. And it's still puzzling to you. And so you begin to look for some sort of an explanation, muttering, it must be some sort of a decorated Roman official who's drawing all of this attention from around the countryside. Your curiosity is piqued even further as you hear faint sounds off in the distance of this crowd that seems to be buzzing with all sorts of energy. At points, you're sure, sure that you can hear loud shrieks of joy above the constant buzz, and you begin to recognize large leaves cut from palm branches that are being carried by the people. Like flags flapping in the air during a parade, these six-foot palm branches are waving back and forth above the crowd. It is indeed a bizarre sight. The waving of palm branches, the faint shrieks of joy heard in the distance. What is making these people act with such abandon, you ask yourself. But it only gets more interesting. You begin to see many of the men in the front actually strip the robes from their bodies. Laying their clothing down on the road behind them, they create a path upon which some honored official likely will pass. And you've seen it before, the stripping as a sign of honor and respect for one who is superior to you. And as you strain your eyes to see who this honored guest is, you are baffled as a small colt emerges from the crowd, parading across all of the discarded clothing and following the waving palm branches. What happens next really strikes you as funny. What? A man who is much too large for the colt straddling the little animal with his feet dragging on the ground, and you chuckle and smile to yourself. It's beginning to look a lot more like a circus than a parade for some respected official. There are people in the crowd running up to this man and shouting in his face, and you aren't sure whether they are praising him or cursing him but you begin to believe that it must be some sort of praise as they continue to lay their clothing down in front of him. The colt and this strange man continue to process towards you, parting the crowd, walking on the clothing, and following the waving palm branches. As they near you, the voices become more distinguishable at one point, you are sure you just heard a woman shriek, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest! 
they couldn't be talking about the silly man riding on this coat, this colt, right? Certainly they couldn't be, couldn't be referring to him. You hear more and more voices rising above the crowd, ringing out these loud hosannas, hosannas over and over again. And you begin to look around again for a Roman official. There must be a chariot pulled by horses somewhere in this crowd. But you see no such chariot. You find no Roman official. And you hear another man's voice ring out, Blessed is the kingdom of our father David, who is coming. The Messiah. They're talking about the Messiah, the one who's going to save us from Roman oppression. Anxiously, you begin to look for a great chariot to part this growing crowd. You want to get a look at this Messiah, but again, you see no such chariot, you see no decorated man, and the crowd begins to bear down on you. Again, you stand on your toes, peering over the waving palm branches for this great leader to emerge. A chariot, a uniform, bodyguards, something that will tell you that the Messiah is right there among the crowd. But still, no chariot, no military man emerges. Only this humble man draped across the back of a small colt. As the mass begins to pass you by, you begin to feel a twinge of disappointment. Rather than discovering the Messiah, you are treated to a shabby looking man sitting on a colt. And as the strange duo of beast and man pass you by, you take one last look to try to understand this strange sight that's unfolding before you. And for the briefest of moments, your eyes meet Jesus' eyes. And for a moment set in eternity, he stares right into your heart, shaking the very foundation upon which you stand. Your breathing quickens. Your body freezes as your whole life suddenly plays out before you. All of the good and the bad, the laughter, the tears, the grief, the joy, the struggles, the successes, the pain, the ecstasy that you have lived out every day of your life all flash before you in that moment. And in the moment it takes for this man to pass from one side of you to the other, your decision is made. You have to know more. You have to know more about this man. Frantically, you begin pawing your way through the crowd. You have to know who he is, where it is he came from, where it is that he is going. But the multitudes of people, the clothing clogging the road, the palm branches striking your face as you edge closer, keep you from getting there. And so in desperation, you finally cry out, who is this man? And an old man next to you grabs your sleeve and begins pulling you along. He stares at you with piercing eyes for a moment and he says, look, I don't know who he is. All I know is that once I was blind and now I see. Another man younger than the first grabs your other arm and gripping it with painful intensity tells you, I don't know either. All I know is that once I was lame, I was a cripple. I could barely pull myself along. I was laughed at, I was kicked and ridiculed. I don't know who he is, but I do know that now I skip from town to town. Now I run for water in the morning, and you know if there isn't any water, I run home again and tell my family. And that's not all, said a woman quietly 
but firmly. I was about to be stoned to death. I'd committed a sin and deserved to die, and I was at death's door, and he commanded them to go away, and they went, all of them. And then he looked at me and just said, woman, sin no more, and he left. The shrieks of joy begin to rise into a fevered pitch. Palm branches are flapping across your face as you're swept up into the irresistible flow of the crowd. Your heart begins to pound with excitement and rising within your gut are your people's hopes for the Messiah. Momentarily, you glance again to see if that chariot has suddenly appeared. By now, though, you're beginning to suspect that the center of attention really is this strange man straddling a colt. Could it be that he is to be our king? Could he be the one to save us from the oppressive hand of the Romans? Will he be the one to give us bread and food enough for all of our families? Again, you look for the chariot and then back to Jesus. <sighs> it just can't be, you think to yourself. And then you begin to question, getting yourself all caught up in the crowd. Maybe it's better to let them go to Jerusalem without you. Yes, you think. Let the multitudes go on, naively putting their hopes in this simple little man, a man with no chariot, no military honors, no bodyguards to protect him. Let them wave their silly palm branches. Let them lay their robes at his feet. You want to leave, but you can't. You keep following. You don't know where he has come from. You don't know who he is. You have no idea where he's going. But now you've heard the stories and you've seen the people's eyes. You've seen the penetrating light of souls which have been touched. You want to get out of the crowd, but you've already heard the story of the woman condemned to death. You want to pretend that you didn't hear any of the testimonies. You want to forget how Jesus looked right past your own eyes and into your soul. You want to ignore the pounding in your heart, but you can't pretend. You can't forget, you can't ignore the rising tide of hope and fear all mixed up inside of you. You want to leave, but you can't. Your mind keeps telling you that this is crazy, but your heart says, follow. Follow him where he's going. Go into Jerusalem with him. Stay by his side. Take the risk and join the journey. And so you follow. You bend down and you grab a fallen palm branch and you carry it half-heartedly, unsure that you want to let the full wave of emotion carry you away. But then you remember his penetrating and loving eyes and remember the story of the man who was born blind and who now sees. And you lift the branch in the air and you begin to wave it slowly. A lump rises in your throat as the branch reaches higher toward the heavens. Still, you're not sure exactly why you're waving it, but your heart says to follow. And you begin to wave it more deliberately. And as you do, a tear begins to form in your eye. And you wave with a little less caution, and then another tear, and another tear. And then finally, with reckless abandon, you begin to wave the branch with broad brushstrokes through the air, and your tear, tears turn into laughter and joy. And you follow. Still, you don't know where he is going, 
but you sense that he knows where he's going. Still, you don't even know his name, and yet you sense that he has known yours from the very beginning of time. Still, you haven't even gotten close enough to touch him, and yet you know that he has already touched you deeply. And so you follow him into Jerusalem. With the ecstatic crowd sweeping you along like a great river, you take this journey with Jesus. And you join those who have been touched and healed and loved and forgiven. And you wave your palm branch with reckless abandon. And finally, with the farmers and fishermen, the families and merchants, the women and children, you join in that chorus of hope singing Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And you follow, you follow, you follow.